Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Woo, hallelujah. What a morning. What a morning. It has been chaos. Is anybody else having chaos this morning? Woo, Jesus is, is here and the devil don't like it. Um, I do want to take a minute and say welcome to Family Church if this is your first time here um, or this is your 50th time here and you're tired of me saying if this is your first time here. But uh, we're glad that you're here. I'm glad for anybody watching online. So let's welcome our online family. We've got everybody literally all over the world. Uh, Honolulu, Nigeria, uh, Alabama, uh, North Carolina, I'm trying to remember all the places. There's a bunch, but uh, it, it's cool since we switched um, live streaming platforms that we get now. It's called the heat map and just watching it grow and seeing how God has taken what's coming here and moving it into other places in uh, not just the states and not just um, this, this city because there's a lot of you and then there's the camera. There's a lot of you watching from St. Augustine and you're well within the distance that you can come in the building <laughs> unless you're not able to. But thank God for, uh, for live stream and online church. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we can reach not just people in the house, but people literally all over the world. And that is all because of your giving. Um, if you're not giving, it's literally not because of you. I'm just kidding. Woo, that sounded harsh. I'm just kidding. If, you, if this is your first time hearing me, I have a very, very dry sense of humor. So if you don't like that, it's going to be a rough time. <laughs> um, the Art of Marriage, we, we did that on uh, Friday and yesterday. And if you came, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Rick and Robbie and, and, and Mark and, and Brenda and, and Jim and Kathy, everybody that shared your story, Brooke and Rodney. Um, I know that takes a lot to get in front of a group of people and speak. Um, you should try to appear sometime. Um, but no, it was, it was a wonderful course. Um, and if you missed it, definitely don't miss the next one. Uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. Um, if you have a youth, what is it, age, or, uh, grades, I got to slow down, grades, six, to 12th, try not to stutter. Our next, um, in the summer, our youth is meeting uh, monthly instead of weekly because we know everybody's traveling around and doing vacations and going to Disney World. Well, probably not Disney World anymore because yikes. Um, but our next one for the youth is July 23rd. That's a Nerf war in the building. Um, we will provide them with the goggles necessary so that you can't sue us and they don't lose their eyes, and we have to pray for healing. Um, the next team meeting is the, the last Sunday of July, right? Okay, good. I'm not failing yet. It is, uh, <laughs> I told, uh, I was talking to Julie and Tia before, uh, while the countdown was going on, and I was trying to decide which microphone I wanted to use, if I wanted to go with the headset today and have full use for all of my activities. But, uh, with, with all of the other things that the devil was fighting against, and, and he fought against me on my notes this morning, he, he made half of them disappear for a minute, and then uh, you saw the issue with the lights, so I said, you know, I'm going to have to get the handheld so I can get the spirit of the Lord on me and get the, bring the house down, bring, bring the fire of heaven down. <clears throat> this morning, we are going to be in the book of Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. Now, it's funny you mentioned uh, praying, have your way, Lord. That is one of the most dangerous prayers that you can pray, uh, because if you don't mean it, you're going to find out just how dangerous it is, um, because God will have his way, whether you like it or not. And it is a whole lot better to just go ahead and submit for the ride that you are on <laughs> instead of thinking you have any control over any of it. Um, but I promise you, if uh, hopefully after today with this message, and I, I pray that it, it speaks to you, and um, I hope after today that you see that submitting to God is much better than anything that you could have planned or envisioned for yourself. Uh, if we can, please all rise for the word of rise for the word of God. I'm in Jeremiah chapter eighteen, chapter eighteen, I will read the first twelve verses, and then we will jump into it. Starting in verse 1, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him 
working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster that I had planned. Woo! And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and it, if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. This is, this is important. Verse 11, now therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. But they will reply, it's no use. <laughs> we will continue with our own plans. We will all follow the stubbornness of our hearts. Woo! Yikes, who's that sound like? Literally everybody. If you think it's not you, guess what? It's you, and it's me. <sighs> Today, I want to talk to you about broken vessels, broken vessels, and, and let's just open up with prayer. Holy Spirit, I thank you for showing up because if you hadn't, we would not know what to do, and we could not do anything without you. So I pray that you use me as your vessel, as your broken vessel, and speak through me. Let your words come out of my mouth. I pray that you convict the hearts that need convicting, and you build up the hearts that need encouragement, God. And I pray your will just be done. Speak to us all, myself included. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Has anybody ever wondered? Now, I like, I know I make a lot of jokes about y'all not speaking back. So we're going to have a practice today. And we're going to have a dialogue, not just a monologue. I know you came to hear about Jesus, but I like to talk. <laughs> so you could talk back. Don't be quiet, please. <clears throat> Has anybody ever felt like God picked the wrong person when he chose you? Good. Good job. Well done. We passed the test. <laughs> uh, because only you, well, you and God, but only you know the depth of your problems and your faults and your failures and all the mess that you make of yourself and all the mess that you make of uh, just our entire lives. And it sounds bleak, but let's be honest and we can be real with each other because this is family church and we're all family and we're all in the body of Christ. We're all just one heck of a mess, and it is only by God that we are doing anything on this planet. So do you ever feel like God has picked the wrong person? Because I tell you, all the time I feel this. <laughs> I feel like, God, you have got the wrong Jared of the phone book when you called me to do this. Uh, if you knew me before anything uh, with this, uh, I would not speak more than five syllables to you, and here I am making y'all... Uh, sit for an hour or more to the point that you hate me, but uh, God, God changed me and he molded me and I believe this is what I'm going to do, but uh, I, I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for it. Um, I, I'm very glad that God called me out of my darkness, and if you're here, I'm glad God called you out of your darkness, um, and I know we kind of jumped into the middle here in Jeremiah 18, so if you've never read the book of Jeremiah, this is at a time when he has already faced a lot of opposition from people plotting against him because they hated his message. Um, and if you think that I am incredibly redundant and I repeat myself a lot, Jeremiah at one point in his message felt, uh, he actually took his complaint to God and talked about he was pretty much exhausted of preaching the same thing over and over again. He was literally tasked with telling um, Judah and Jerusalem, I think, if I mess that up, somebody will call me out. But he was tasked with telling them about how they were headed towards destruction. There was an impending destruction coming towards them because they had turned towards uh, false gods. They had turned their, their, their backs and their hearts away from God, and they weren't following God. They weren't committed to God. They weren't doing really anything for God. 
And so he was tasked with having to repeat to the people over and over and over again. And uh, something like 20 or more years before he even got, um, oh, I forget the name of his scribe, but he hired, basically got somebody that would write everything down for him after 20 years. Um, and there's actually no record really of any <laughs> positive response towards anything that he preached. So uh, I know how that feels. When, that's why I made the joke about, you know, you guys talk back, and I know he might not say it, but when it's quiet, <laughs> you're like, oh, no. Um, and not that I'm trying to feed off the room or anything, but it is nice to know that you're hearing what I feel like God has put into my heart. Um, and so Jeremiah, like I said, he, he faced opposition. He faced uh, heartache. He was cut off from his family. He was cut off from his friends. He lived a, a very lonely life. He was cut off from everybody just because he had to preach this message of destruction. And he eventually gets to the point that he laments the day he was born. Has anybody ever been <laughs> so rough and so down and out that you're literally like, I just wish I wasn't even born? Um, this is how you can relate to the Bible because they are, even though he was a prophet and we literally have a whole book named after him and his, and his story and the record of it, these are real people. Uh, with real issues, with real heartache. They have real problems just like we have problems. Um, so you can't approach the Bible just like it's a boring little history book. It is something to live by, to apply to your life by. Um, and if you think that God picked the wrong person, God still chose him for this task. And he even called him when he was 17 years old. And obviously, uh, that's a very difficult task to warn people of their terrible decline and their incoming destruction. I don't think anybody, <laughs> except maybe a bunch of Baptist church, wanted to just preach uh, doom and gloom and nothing wrong with the Baptist, just having a fun little time. But uh, <laughs> it is at this moment in the story that God has taken him down to the potter's house in order to give him a new direction, to give him something he can see. And uh, what, what a great thing when God blesses you with an illustration that you can apply to your life, because most often we just get the direction. We don't get, we don't get the illustration. We can't see what's going to come our way. We just have to walk in faith. So it's, it's great that he gets this nice visual of just how it is in the process that God uses in our own lives, that he is awakened to the fact that while they're headed towards captivity, while they are headed towards their destruction, while they are headed towards something that is going to break them. It is not for their doom. It is for their discipline. What is coming against you is not to destroy you. Man cannot curse what God has blessed. You cannot cancel what God has called. It might be coming against you. It might be trying to break you, but it is not for your destruction. It is for your discipline, for your discipline. And if you've ever had to discipline your child, you know just um, how necessary it is for their growth. But you also know the pain of how it feels, because obviously none of us want to smack the heck out of our children uh, just so they get a little sense in them. But sometimes they need that, right? Uh, unfortunately, there's not enough of that going around, and that's why the, the nation is absolutely crazy. But that's a message for another time. So Jeremiah, he's called at a time. They've, they've turned their hearts against God. They're literally, they're following a path that is leading them to destruction. They're literally following the false gods. They're, they're participating in child sacrifice, um, which is just absolutely horrendous and disgusting. And, and it's just a terrible thing. But they have turned their back so far against God that they are following these pagan gods, these Babylonian gods. And they're slipping further and further into moral decay, into spiritual decay. And that's why God has called Jeremiah to warn these people, to get them to repent of their sins and turn their hearts back to him. And of course, as soon as God says he is called and set apart for his purpose, Jeremiah, like we do, starts listing all the reasons why he cannot do it. Listen to me. Just because it's not on your resume doesn't mean you can't receive it. You might think you can't speak. You might think you're too young or you're too old or you don't have enough experience or you don't know the Bible well enough 
or you don't you can't uh, you know just pull scripture out like a sword you might not have enough you might not have enough money you might not think you have enough time and we try to cut ourselves off from the calling as if, as if we know more than God does you know God I don't I don't think you've got the right guy I don't think you meant me when you called me for this task surely you should have seen just how broken and messed up I was <laughs> I'll, I'll rat on myself I was working in a in a, in a power line career uh, is there any blue collar people in here Okay, I know exactly how you talk when you're at work. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. So I'm like, God, you want me to preach? Do you see what every other word that's coming out of my mouth is right now? But uh, blessed, blessed. I am blessed. He, uh, he will, I, I will be a testament. He will change you. He will shape you. He will rip the mess out of your tongue and change you for good. And you think that you're just a mess, and there's, there's so many other people that could do this, right? There's so many other people that are equipped for this. And God always cuts our excuses off and reminds us of who he is because he is the one with us. And when he is with us, we are and will be equipped with everything we need when we need it. If you have read the Do the New You book, mindset number six, God has given me everything I need for the season I am in. God has given me everything I am in for the season I am in. He's given you everything that you need for what you are walking through right now. Jeremiah is facing opposition, but God told him, this will be tough. They will come against you. They will hate you. They will attack you. But do not be afraid of them because today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land. They will fight you. They will fight against you. But they will not overcome you because I am with you and I will rescue you. He will rescue you. Somebody needs to be reminded that God never said it would be easy. Oops. God never said it would be quick. Uh-oh. God never said you would be comfortable. And you're like, hang on, pastor. God never said you would be liked. And now you're like, I think I'm, I might have a different idea and I want to kind of get off of this ride right now. God never said that you would be without trouble. He said that he will be with you and it will be worth it. He said he will rescue you. That doesn't mean that there won't be problems. That doesn't mean your kids won't be crazy, even when you've tried to bring them up in the right way and tried to teach them the Bible. That means you're still going to probably have unpaid bills. That means you might still face a, for, a face a foreclosure on your house or the loss of a business or an unexpected illness or you're walking through divorce. But there is a reason for the rescue. You don't get rescued from nothing. If nothing is happening, there's no reason for a rescue. Is Tyler still here? No. Perfect. I get to pick on him. Every time when, when, we're, when we were in youth weekly, and we're always like, hey, is there anything going on in your life? Can we pray for you? Tyler is always like, oh, everything is good. Everything is great. You know, I just, I can't, I don't need anything. Else. You know, like those super sanctified, I'm blessed, sanctified, and covered in the Holy Ghost, and I got the oil going on on me, and blah, 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 blah. You're like, I, you're okay, you're lying right now, so let's go to the altar. I know there's something in your life, and if there's nothing going on, just wait, because it's probably right around the corner getting ready to humble you and come into your life and upset you. But God is reminding you that just because the situation looks bad, just because the problems keep piling up, just because the economy doesn't look too great in the eyes of men, just because there's every mess imaginable against you, just because there's a, a big debate that everyone, everybody wants to talk about and we're all worried about it, doesn't mean there's no deliverance. God is there to rescue you. He is there to redeem you. He is there to restore you, to renew you, to lift you up with God on your side. What can stand against you? Mm. And Jeremiah gets called at a young age to go out and warn everybody. You are not in for a good time. <laughs> God ends up telling Jeremiah, how they exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. And by default, they have become worthless themselves. Without God, it sounds so rude and so mean. And if you hate me, awesome. If, if you are without God, you are worthless. Worthless. 
But that is why Jesus came down. And he said that you were worth it all, that you were worthy of it all. And he came down and he left heaven and he came down and he threw off every power that he had up in heaven. Well, not every, you know what I'm saying. He came down and he died for you to be resurrected for your sins because you are worth it. You are worth it. With God, you are worth it. But without him, we are worthless because we follow false gods. We follow false idols. And he says to literally be appalled at this, like the state of the nation right now, to be appalled at it and shudder with horror that they have forsaken him, that the spring of living water, and they dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They cannot hold water. That is us without Jesus following ourselves, following worthless idols, living lives that are ultimately completely meaningless. And we think we're doing okay until we hopefully wake up one day and realize the error of our ways and realize just how broken we are when we live in the world. We are like broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And a cistern, obviously, for uh, anybody from somewhere not as educated as here, I don't want to pick on anybody today. Uh, a reservoir, it is a reservoir at this time, used to store up rainwater. Now, I know in Florida, until recently, we didn't really have to worry about it drying up too much. We didn't have to worry about the rain too much, especially with hurricane season coming up. But when you live in this place where Jeremiah is, when you live in a dry place, they get less than half of the rain that we see here in Florida. It is important to store up what you don't need in this day for what you will need in the drought. You need to store up what you think you don't need now for what you will need later. You see the testing of Jesus in the desert and how he threw out scripture. Apart from him being the living word of God, he still studied it as a child. And that is how he could talk uh, at the devil and come back at him with the truth of Scripture when the devil tried to twist Scripture. He didn't look for Scripture on the day that he needed it. He already had it stored up in him, so it would bubble up and overflow in the moment that he needed it. But God refers to them as broken cisterns that cannot hold the water, and the problem with them and the problem that we can slip into is that we allow ourselves to remain broken so nothing can be poured into us and stored up. And we end up like the Israelites told Jeremiah, it's no use. It's no use. I'm just going to continue doing it my way. That way's easier. I can make more money doing it that way. I can go to bed when I want. I can have Sundays to go out on the boat and go fishing to get to the football game early. Whatever it is, I can do that because it's easier than following Jesus. And I think that way is easier. That Jesus stuff is just a, just a bunch of junk, and it's only for the weak people. But God has so much more in store for you, so much more in store for all of us. But we just want to remain stubborn and stuck and never move forward, even when just one step we can see what he will do. Last week when I talked about moving in your maybe, and God will send someone unexpected to speak his message, but we reject the person because they don't fit the box of who I want speaking to me. I don't like tattoos. That guy's wearing a t-shirt. That guy's too young. I'm older than him. I know more than him. I'm not going to sit under someone younger than me and listen to correction over my life because they have not lived long enough to tell me how to live my life. Woo! I'm getting too deep today. I'm sorry. And the people constantly reject Jeremiah's warnings to turn back to God. And they reject the correction, and they even kill some of the other prophets that God sends. And while this sounds completely crazy in our culture today, kind of, we still see this when someone comes and they try to warn the culture of the chaos that is about to ensue. When they try to tell the land, you can't be what you think you're supposed to, you cannot identify with something that you weren't given. If it's not in your genetics, guess what? You're not what you say you are. You can't be a dog or a donkey or a cat. Well, you can be a donkey, but I can't use the other word in church. But you cannot identify as something that God did not give you. 
And they come and they try to warn the land, this is not how God wants you to live. And they will get canceled. Because the people want to cancel them instead of listening to correction. And the big problem with people is that they think at this time, and they keep rejecting him at this time, because they think that just keeping up with the temple practices will protect them. In today's culture, they think just coming to church is all you need to do. They literally just went in and went through the motions and they treat God like a prisoner of their worship services. As if God only needs their sacrifices. As long as we keep going to church, everything's going to be fine. And we end up treating God like a box to be checked off instead of genuinely pursuing a relationship with him and leaving it all behind and following him. And I come to church every week, well, every couple of weeks, you know, or a Christer, and I come on Christmas and Easter, and, you know, we'll listen to the couple of little songs that they're going to sing, and I'll sit there for the sermon, but are you, are you stewing on the sermon? Do you let it get inside of you and ruminate on it? See, I, I know I bring a lot, and I talk for a long time. I like to give you all a little spiritual Tupperware that you can take home and unpack and listen to it again and again and again and get something different out of it every time. But we come here and we fall into the trap that we think commitment to God looks like literally just coming to church. The the Savior, Jesus, does not want surface level faith. He is the well that never runs dry. And so many of us are content with just skimming the surface. We jump in the well and paddle along the top and jump back out of the well because we don't want to get too far away from the world. And then we jump back in the well and skim the top and we never realize just how deep it goes and how good life would be if we just keep diving deeper and deeper and deeper into the well, into the water. He wants to get deep down in you. He wants to get to the root of your problems, not to just put a Band-Aid on them. He wants to get to the root of your pain, to the root of your brokenness. He wants to remove it and he wants to restore you. But that takes so much more than just coming to church and sitting there and thinking that's all God does. And that's all where God is. He's not only in this building. He literally lives inside of you, inside of you. And he is watching every move you make, every move I make, every idle word, every idle thought. Oh, this is way heavier than I thought it was going to be. But apparently this is what we need. And Jeremiah calls for their repentance. And the people reject it so much that now... People from his hometown plot to kill him. So he takes his pain to God. He takes his pain to God. He takes his pain to God. He didn't take it to a bottle. He didn't take it to a pill. He didn't take it to an ex. He didn't take it to another person. He didn't take it to a website. He didn't take it to a club. He didn't take it to a bar. He went straight to God. He went straight to the source. The only one that could actually do something about it. And he pours himself out to God. God already knows every thought that you have. He knows every doubt that you have. There's so many of us that that don't want to get real with God. Like he's afraid of our doubts. Like he's afraid of our problems. Like he's afraid of what we're going to ask him because we're dealing with something and we're struggling with something, but we don't want to bring it to him because apparently we think we can hide it from someone who is completely out of time and that created us and the only one that could do anything about it but we want to keep trying to put it in our own hands and holding it in our own thoughts and keeping it in our own hearts and instead of following God and releasing it to him we just want to hold on to it there now you got to go back and watch that to understand what I just said (laughs) YouTube has a slow down function slow it down and he takes it to God and God doesn't, God doesn't give him a gentle answer first. God tells him, if you can't handle these easy times, you're probably not going to survive the harder times. Woo! Apparently, when it's bad, it can get worse. And if you think it's bad and that's going to crush you, you're not going to survive what's going to come further down the line. Have you ever thought, oh, this is really bad, and then it got even worse? And you find yourself looking towards the past, longing for the days where it just seemed a little bit easier. Anybody remember being a kid and you're like, I cannot wait to get older. I can't wait to have my, I can't wait to get out of the house and I don't got to follow what you're saying. 
and I can do what I want. And then you got there and you're like, oh, wait, I can't do what I want because now all I can do is go to work and come home and try to pay bills and go to work and come home and try to pay bills. And now I got this backache. Nobody ever told me that there was a backache when you got older. And it doesn't matter how much you sit on the heating pad or the massaging pad. That thing ain't going away. And it, was, it looked so much better back then when there wasn't this pressure on me now. And it is the pressure that either makes us or breaks us. And we think of pressure as a problem. We think pressure, pushing down on me, pressing down on you, no man asked for. Under pressure, that brings a building down, splits a family in two, and puts people on streets. Y'all acting like you don't know Queen. And we feel the effects of the pressure. We feel the bumps and the bruises. And instead, <laughs> oh, my ADD head. No, that wasn't a preach. <laughs> I say, y'all want to act like you don't know Queen, but you'd rather be fat bottom girls instead of under pressure. <laughs> you said preach it. I'm just kidding. This is a heavy sermon, so I'm going to take some, some laughter and some smiles where we can get it, all right? Y'all just, we're working it out together. <laughs> We feel that, oh, there's like six people that just turned off live stream right now. <laughs> Already walking out. We feel, <laughs> we feel the effects of pressure. We feel the bumps and the bruises, right? And, and instead of uh, considering that, that pressure can be a blessing, we look at it like it's a burden. And, and, and at, 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 at a time woo, when life can become increasingly difficult for Jeremiah, and he keeps Preaching, preaching, and they keep plotting. He keeps preaching, they keep plotting. He keeps preaching, and they keep plotting against him. And they keep ignoring him, and they don't want to listen. And finally, he gets to this point, and God tells him to go to the potter's house. And it is here that he gets to see how this works, how God works as he sees fit, as he sees fit. Because he can shape and he can mold as he sees fit. And he tells Jeremiah how if he warns the people that they are headed for destruction, but they repent, he will relent. The disaster will not come. The disaster will not come if they turn from their ways. But if they are headed towards being up and being uh, planted and being built up, if, even if they're headed towards a good thing and they're headed towards something new, something better, something with more life, but they decide that they want to go back to their ways and they lose sight of God and they go on their own path, then he will reconsider the good that he had intended for them. And it is here that we see how God is the potter and we are the product. We are the clay. He is the potter and we are the product. But we play a part in the process. See, God is the one that can shape us and mold us into something new, but it is by our actions that decides what he does with it, what he molds it into. Because you can, do, you can be do, doing everything fine and trying to live for Jesus, and at any minute you can choose to turn your back on God and go the other way and decide to try to do it yourself. And newsflash, it doesn't work out too good if you do that. And you will see all the destruction that is the end result of the devotion to yourself. Because if you're not following God and you think you're just going on your own way, the truth is you're actually just following the devil. And you're headed towards destruction. You are not in charge of your life. And if you're not with God, you're going the wrong way. When you try to make your own, own way, it's never the outcome that you think it was. Because you can live a life of seeming peace, of seeming peace, but you will find out after you die that seeming peace is not the same as saving peace. Seeming peace is what you get when you think it, you've got it all going on and all the money's in the bank, the kids have moved out and everything is kosher, everything is good. We don't fight, we don't argue. Everything is just amazing. And I've got all that I could ask for and I did it all without God. And we think that sounds great. And it seems peaceful. Has anybody seen that movie, God's Not Dead? 
And there's the scene where there's the, uh, I think it's the mother has dementia and she has no idea what's going on. And there's a, there's a scene where her son is a very wealthy uh, like CEO or something in a business and he comes to visit her finally after avoiding it for the majority of the movie and he's sitting down and she's just like staring blankly off into the distance like we do when I'm speaking. And, <laughs> and um, he tells her, he's like, I, he's like I, I don't get it. I've got everything I could ask for and I did all this stuff and you spent your entire life preaching God and following God, and it has been nothing but problems, and now you have no idea what's even going on. You can't even have a conversation with me, and I've got everything I could ask for, and he did it without God, and in a complete God moment and clarity, she doesn't even look at him, but she's like, sometimes the devil lets people live an easy life because that's all it takes to get them to go on the wrong path. So it seems like you've got peace. But then you get to the end of the story and you realize that life is never meant to be lived like that. Life is meant to be lived in service to God, to follow Jesus, to love Jesus, to keep him in your heart and follow and emulate him because you are his mirror image. You are God's mirror image. You are meant to show him off, to display his glory. And that is what saving peace looks like. It is a peace that passes understanding. It is a peace that doesn't go away when disaster drains your bank account. When there's debates, I'm not going to get political. When there's a peace that doesn't depart when everyone else in your life does. There's a peace that no matter what happens, what no matter what may come, God has got me in his hands. And if it is cut off from me, it must be for a reason. If it is coming against me, it must be for a reason. If the lights are freaking out and the microphone's not working, it must be for a reason. Because there's something that the people need to hear today because they need to be shaped. And if it's attacking me, it must be because of my anointing. See, the devil doesn't fight himself. Jesus said a divided house does not stand. You see why that is Christianity is the only religion that ever gets attacked. You ever notice that? Because all the other ones are false and they're all just from the devil and they're all just following false gods. Jesus is the one true God, the savior of the world. Pay attention to what's going on because the only thing they come against is God and us because they know the truth. The devil does not fight himself when you're living for him. He will let you keep doing what you're doing. He will let you keep going out every Friday night and drinking until four in the morning. And then, well, when you're 21, it doesn't matter. But in your 30s, all of a sudden, it's a whole lot different. But he will let you keep doing that, right? But as soon as you start following Jesus, that stuff doesn't look attractive to you anymore. Because he is renewing you and he is changing the way. And you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And it is at the moment that you begin to push forward towards God. And walk further and further away from the enemy in your past. That is when he will attack you the most. Every time you get closer to your breakthrough, the attack will always get greater. The pressure will get worse because the purpose is great. The size of the attack is in direct proportion to the size of the anointing over your life. The calling over your life. And I will keep saying it until you get it. We are all called according to God. We are all different tools in his hands it ain't just about the talking head at the front of the room there's teachers think about tools think about how you eat breakfast as crazy as that may look you've got a bowl you've got to have a spoon you've got to have a fork there's different tools we all have a different purpose to come through and if there is big problems in your life because you're headed towards a breakthrough, that just means there's a big blessing right around the corner. There is a big breakthrough right around the corner. And if the pressure feels heavy, just know that your purpose has a weight to it. W-E-I-G-H-T. It has a weight to it. It can feel heavy at times. But you have no idea just how many people will be touched by it. To be touched by your purpose. And as much as the purpose has a weight that can push down on you and put the pressure on you, it also has a weight. A time that you have to wait for it. You have to wait through it. Jeremiah got to the point 
where there was so much bad happening in his life and there's so much bad happening in your life that you just get so frustrated and you get to the point that you're like, God, can we just get this over with? Just go ahead and bring the destruction. I'm ready to move into the next phase of my life. Even if it's not going to be fun, I'm just ready to get out of this mess. Let it happen already. Just let it fall apart so we can move on with our lives. And it feels like it gets more rough until it's finally released. And this is why you have to realize what that pressure truly is. Because like the potter, like the potter is shaping the vessel, there cannot be pressure on one side only. It has to come in equal amounts. And I thought about wearing, you know, the leather microphone and bringing a piece of clay, but no way that I was going to be able to do anything like that, just to give an illustration. But if you push down while you're trying to uh, shape clay and you only push on the outside, it's just going to mash it down into a ball and nothing's going to happen because you have to have that pressure also equally from the inside. The outside pressure just crushes it. The outside pressure can ruin the entire process because there's nothing inside pushing back against it. The outside pressure in your life can break you, but you need the inside pressure to build you. The outside pressure can break you, but you need the pressure from the inside to build you up. And we have all of these pressures, all of the things you can think of that are on the outside pushing against you, the economy right now, the government, the schools, the kids, your family, your work, your finances, your relationships. Don't look at anybody next to you if that's you. And we used to tell these, you know, you always used to, well, I haven't told my kids yet because they're not older, but you remember telling your kids about peer pressure and how people are going to try to push you and pressure you into doing things that's not meant for them. That goes against their values, things that aren't good for them because you're trying to protect them. And we have all of these outside pressures crushing down on us that we often neglect to go to God and seek his hand over our life because we need his hand to help shape us. His hand is the inside pressure that comes and it is equally uncomfortable, isn't it? When you start feeling that pressure mm -mm, on the inside to trust God in the process of the pressure. Because now you've got something pushing you down from the outside. You've got those outside pressures. Life doesn't stop. The bills don't stop. The economy doesn't stop. The, the, the government doesn't stop. The schooling doesn't stop. Work doesn't stop. That's all pushing down on you. But now, since you're a Christian, God is holding you to a higher standard. And he is stretching you and pushing you and stretching your faith. And it's difficult to trust him over your finances when you just see the bank account keep getting lower and lower and lower. And it's difficult to trust him in a situation that started over a year ago. And you thought, surely this would have been done six months ago. And it's difficult to trust him with your husband or with your wife. And you keep praying that they're going to come to church, but nothing seems to have changed yet. And just like Jeremiah, we are completely at the mercy of our maker and have nothing else to do except complete and utter trust and obedience to God's plan. And I know you're sitting here thinking today, surely there's no way God can use me. I have done so many bad things. I have made so many mistakes. I was literally still messing up and cussing when I pulled into the parking lot this morning. I was still messing up. And this is not me. I'm just using general things because <laughs> this next one. I'll just use you. You were still messing up when you woke up in someone else's bed that you weren't supposed to be in a couple days ago. That's why I didn't put I on that one because y'all would have been like, oh, guilty. And I just, you just can't <laughs> ever seem to get it right. And we're tired of feeling like everything we do is wrong. And we're tired of stumbling around every day waiting for the pressure to lift. But God does not lift the pressure. He lifts you. God doesn't take the weight off of you. You can either let it crush you or you can stand up like when you go to the gym and begin to push yourself and stretch yourself. Because we think 
As long as we can attain, you know, six-pack abs or a big chest or some legs, for most of us that actually squat, um, we think that, you know, by lifting heavier weights, we can get stronger, we can get builder. But when God puts a weight on us, we just want to fold under the pressure. God is not going to lift the pressure from you. He's going to put his hand in you and put the pressure inside of you to build you up and to shape you and to get you to rise up on your feet, to get you to push back against the pressure of the world and to get you to realize that his purpose for your life is greater than anything that the enemy can throw against you. So he will not lift the pressure off of you, but he will lift you to withstand the pressure against you. And you've been trusting God and you're coming to church, but you're tired of going through the same situation over and over again. And there's the stereotypical preacher just up there shouting, trust God, just do it, just trust him. And you're like, I've been trusting him, but I feel way too broken right now to be used by God. And you need to realize today that the negative thoughts that you think aren't from you. And they're definitely not from God. You hear the story of people whose thoughts and they say, it's just in my head, you should kill yourself. I don't know about you, but I don't talk to myself in my head saying you. And God would never tell you to kill yourself. That is the enemy applying more outside pressure. That is the enemy putting pressure on you to stop the process that God is doing in your life. That is the enemy trying to stop your promise. That is the enemy trying to break you. And if you think you're too broken to be used by God, you need to step back and remember and realize just who was used in the Bible every single time that God did great things. You need to realize just who God uses because God only uses broken vessels because broken vessels are all that God has to use. They are the only options that God has to pick from when he goes to do his plan. Everybody that he has to use for his purpose are all imperfect people. And I don't know about you, but that releases me from the pressure of trying to be something that I'm not, from the pressure of trying to control something that I can't from the pressure of trying to live up to a standard that was never meant to be reached by anyone other than Jesus because he was the only perfect, he is the only perfect person. That is why he is the only perfect person to live. I don't have to get it together. You don't have to get it together because Jesus already paid it all for you. Jesus lived as if he sinned so you can live as if you don't. That is why grace is called a gift. That is why it is not by your effort to do better. That is why it is not by your works. There is nothing you can do to save yourself because it is not up to you. Because you will fail and I will fail. It isn't up to what you do or what you have done. It is entirely up to the complete and finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The lamb that was slain. The one who shed his blood for me, who shed his blood for you. He already came down and did what nobody else could do to do what nobody else ever can do so that we don't have to. We just get to live in the glory of his grace. And guess what? When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees his spirit. Y'all ain't shouting and I'm preaching better than you're shouting. He sees his spirit in you. Your past is not your identity. Your problems are not your identity. Nothing about you other than Jesus is your identity. Everybody wants to say, I am depressed. I am broken. I am bitter. I am feeling this way. I am trying to identify as this. I am an American. Guess what? It doesn't matter. The only thing you are is a Christian. You're not an American Christian. You're not an Ethiopian Christian. You're not a Christian from Alabama. You will, yeah. (laughs) You are a Christian. That is your identity. Jesus is in you. Everything else doesn't matter. When you are accepted into the body of Christ, all of that other stuff goes out of the window. Not your personality and the things that make you unique, but you are not the things that you want to put over your life. You are what God has already put inside of you. You are covered by the blood of Jesus. He gave you his life, and that is life abundantly. So you don't have to, re- so you have to realize the lies of the enemy when you feel like you're broken, when you feel like you're a mess, if all God has to use are broken vessels, 
Baby, you're not broken. You're being made new. You are being made new into something. You are being made into something new. That pressure inside of you, that pull that God is pulling you towards, that pull that he is lifting you out of the world, that pull that he is lifting you out of sin, that he is lifting you out of addiction, that he is lifting you out of bondage, that he is lifting you out of generational curses and brokenness. It is on purpose. It is for a purpose. It is building you up for a purpose. God is shaping you because he wants to do a new thing through you. Can we put verse four back up on the screen? Jeremiah 18, four. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. Another word for marred that is used in a different translate, I think the ESV, is spoiled. Spoiled. Y'all, we call our kids spoiled when they always get their way, and that's usually your fault. It is your fault. Parenting 101. Uh, And they always end up, once you give them everything they want, you give them an inch and they take a mile. Now, the next time when you don't want to give them something, they throw a fit. They throw a tantrum. And we call them spoiled. Spoiled. And we try to go our own way for so long that we get spoiled because we think we don't need God. And then once he tries to remove something from our life that we have always had or had for a long time, we are spoiled little brats and we don't want him to cut it off from us because we can't live without it. And we get hung up thinking we are spoiled or we're broken beyond repair that we don't realize he can and he is and he will shape you into something new. Put it up one more time. The end of that verse. It was marred. It was spoiled in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot. Just leave that for a minute. He formed it into another pot. He didn't go get another piece. He didn't go get another piece to add on to it. He took what was and mushed it down and put more outside pressure on it so he could put new inside pressure on it to take what looked broken, to take what looked spoiled, to take what looked marred, to take what looked like it was stained, to take what looked like it was tainted, to take what looked like it couldn't be used, to take what looked like was messed up, and he made it into something new. But first he had to push it down into a lump. He had to renew it. He had to start over. That is what the pressure is. And shaping it as best as seemed best to him. As what seemed best to him. Shaping it as seemed best to him. That doesn't say shaping it as seemed best to Jared. It doesn't say what seemed best to shape towards Philip or Kathy or Kelsey or Mark or whoever, whatever your name is right now. It's not up to you. That means the design is in his head. That means we don't know what's going on. That means when the pressure is forming us and things are being cut off and moved around and shifted, it is not at random. It is on purpose for a purpose. It is the design that is in his thoughts and his thoughts are not your thoughts and his ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So while it always feels new to you, that's only because you've never seen what the original design was for your life. You can take it down. Thank you. You've never known exactly what God has planned for you. You've never known just how you're going to look up, how you're, how you're going to end up looking one day when you follow him on his path and you walk through your purpose and you walk in your purpose that you probably still do not know the full extent of. <clears throat> And you've never known it, so it will always feel new to you when he is doing (coughs) something new to you. But it is not new to God. Because that you is the one that he always knew. If y'all know how to spell, that's an extra letter, K. 
It's the you that was formed in your mother's womb. It was the you that was set apart before you were born. It's the you that was that he already knew before you were even formed, before he even formed the world. He already knew it. It's the you that he knew needed to get placed here in this seat, in this time, in that family, in that job, in those kids' lives, in that in your friends' lives, in your family's life. It is the you that needed to be here and now for the purpose that he has. For you. That's the you that he always knew. That is the you that he is bringing you to. That is the you that he is building you up to. That is the you that you are getting from the pressure that is inside of you, that you feel in you to grow you into your purpose. And I'm going to keep saying it until you get it. That is the point of the pressure. God is putting pressure on us because he wants to do a new thing. And you can either resist it or you can respond to it. You can resist it like the people in verse 12 and choose to go your own stubborn way. And that's why the pressure always ends up getting worse because it's only one sided. But don't let that pressure cause you to push back against God's purpose because you will get stuck in a cycle of repeating tests over and over and trials over and over because you haven't figured it out yet. That's why it keeps repeating and it feels redundant because we are resisting it. We feel the pressure and we push back because we cling to our own ideologies and our own insecurities and our own fears because stepping forward in faith looks unsure and we don't want to do that. We want to stay where it looks safe and I can see everywhere that I'm going. God is trying to stretch you So you need to respond, not resist. Because responding is submitting to the process. It is submitting to God's will for your life and how he is shaping it to be. What he wants to shape it to be. Don't resist anymore. The pressure can seem great at times. It will will feel great. But I believe it only gets worse the more that we push back against it, the more that we fight it. And the external pressure is there to break us. It is there to make us feel like we are being crushed. But God desires to change you internally from the inside out. That is how you get built up from the inside pressure. And if that pain, that pain of faith, you remember from last week, the pain of faith never outweighs the promise of God. The purpose in your life is worth the pain of the pressure that you're feeling because God's vision for you is greater than your vision for you. You think you're just supposed to work nine to five or 80 hours a week and that's all you were meant to do. No, that's what they told you to do. That's what they have pushed down into your head. And, 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 and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Programmed condition. They have conditioned you to look to to. To believe that that's all life is about is just going to work and coming home, going to work and coming home, going to work and coming home. That's why school, if you homeschool your kids, you can get it done in 30 minutes to an hour. But we send them off to be with teachers that teach them God knows what. And they're with their teachers way more. They are with you. So when you come home and yeah, you might just want to sit down and crack open a cold one and watch the game on TV. You still got to be putting something in your kid's life because your their teachers are if you're not. And if you're not going to raise them, somebody else will. And then you're going to wake up when they're a teenager and be like, oh, no, what happened? You, you didn't happen. God's vision for you is greater than your vision for you. You've got to submit to his process, to his pressure. Because when you submit to it, it will bring restoration. Restoration. It will bring restoration to restore you. And we always think of restoration as returning to the original design. If you buy an old house that is falling apart and you want to rebuild it and you want to restore it, there's some people, yes, that will probably just want to keep it the original design. But restoration is not just about making it new. It's about making it better than it was before. It's about making it more than it was before. It's about not just restoring it to what it once was, but repurposing it to be something greater than it ever was, to keep the design, but to be more. 
And God wants to restore you, not just to what you were, but to what you will be, what he wants you to be, what he wants you to live out, the purpose that he wants to live out, the people that he wants to put in your life so that you will reach them, so that you will speak to them, so that you can lead them to Jesus, so he can get more glory. And people won't have to submit and fall into eternal damnation. Restoration is always more than the original. So today, you're not broken. You're just being made new. And you're not just being restored. You're being repurposed. And you may have felt like your purpose was something. And then that was removed from your life. And now you're stepping into a new season. Or you were serving in the church in one capacity back here 30 years ago. And now times have changed. And you feel like a square peg in a round hole. And you can't fit and you keep trying to go into the round hole, but you don't realize that God changed the board around. And he repurposed the board and now he's putting new things on the board. And it's not that you're being formed into a circle so you can go through the round hole. It's just that you need to realize you're not made for this anymore. He's repurposing you to do something else. See, a lot of the older generation, they think that us younger people are just wanting to come into church and kick you out because we want to do it our own way. That's not the case. That will not be the case. And, oh man, I'll just get real. I feel like a lot of that, honestly, is just insecurity because as we're navigating life, we're stepping into new seasons and new situations, and we're all doing this for the first time. And if you think you're not, that we will pray for you because you're just psychotic. <laughs> we're all doing this for the first time. And we get older. And, you know, we joke, oh, the back pains and everything. But we get older and we can't do the things that we used to do. We went to the gymnastics place or whatever for one of the kids' birthdays. And last year, I could jump around and have fun with the kids. This year, I jumped and I hurt my knee for like a month and a half. I can't do the things that I used to do. At least, you know, not just jumping right into it without stretching. Without stretching, without stretching and warming things up, to warm up to the idea that God isn't done with you yet. None of us think about breathing, and for some of us, thank God. (laughs) Because if it wasn't an involuntary response, that would not go good for some people. Has anybody thought about it the entire time I've been talking? Nope. You've just been doing it. In, out. In and out. Nobody died, praise the Lord, while I was in the middle of the sermon. And that means God literally is not done with you. And that is evidence of the fact that you are still sitting here taking a breath every few seconds. Just because there's younger people coming up doesn't mean you're being phased out. It just means you have a new purpose. You are being repurposed. And you can end up being bitter about it and fighting against it and pushing against it because you're upset that you can't do what you used to do So now you don't want to do anything except be mad at the younger people that are stepping up. Instead of celebrating the fact that God is continuing something, instead of letting it die, and instead of being bitter about it, you can learn to be a blessing and pour into someone else's life. Like you are going to step up and be pouring out into men's life, stepping into this new season. You have wisdom that the younger people need, that we need. And don't take this the wrong way, and I do not mean this arrogantly, but we have wisdom as well for you. 
I may not have lived as long as you lived, have lived, because <laughs> you're not done. But uh, I didn't walk the path that you walked. And you haven't walked the path that I walked. And so by that, the scenery for you and the things that you have learned are completely different than the scenery that I have seen and the things that I have learned. And just like a father can pour wisdom into his son, the older generation can pour wisdom into the younger, but you can still accept wisdom from the younger. And we can have conversations and grow together as a people for a purpose. God doesn't just use people, you know, from their 20s until their 40s and then, oh, you're, you're put back on the shelf until you die and you go to heaven and you get a new body. And, oh, praise God, my back doesn't hurt anymore. You know, I've got a perfect body. There's still a reason you were, you're here. And just because your purpose has changed doesn't mean you need to inflict pain on someone else because you don't want to accept it yet. If you're moving into something new, that's something to celebrate. That's something to be happy about because you still have something to do think about Moses 120 and he died and he still had strength but he was done he was done and God took him up so if you're still here you're not done you're not done and you should celebrate it because you think of the image of the potter the clay has not been put in the furnace yet to be hardened so while you may have been a bowl, as a weird analogy to use, but while you may have been a bowl over here, or a plate, or a fork, or a knife, while you may have been something in this season of your life, God is still able to push pressure from not just the outside, but the inside and reshape you into, instead of just something that can be used, something like a vessel, something like a vase that can hold something, something that can be poured into so that can then pour out into someone else's life. To be repurposed, you might have been something in your past, but now you are something else moving into the future. And you can resist that. You can push against that process. You can push against the pressure. But if there's only pressure on one side, it will collapse. And then the day comes when life ends or Jesus comes back and there is no more clay in the potter's hands. All of the vessels and all of the tools that were made are complete. They're done. And for us Christians, that is the best day of our lives to start eternity in glory in heaven with God and to never have any failures anymore, no more fears, no more depression, no more sadness, no more anger, no more bitterness, no more brokenness, no more fighting, no more tears, no more bad memories, a new body. Everything will be perfect. But for those of us that resisted the potter's hands and wanted to remain broken, the furnace will harden the lump of clay and it will never be what it was supposed to be. And it will be a lump of nothing, a worthless piece of clay that is now hard for the rest of eternity. You can do the lights. the drill they're going to play another song and if you need prayer you, you can come down here and somebody will pray for you 
but I want us collectively as a body, as, as a church, to not resist God in his process, to not resist the potter. Don't resist the Savior. Resist the serpent who comes in and wants to push against the church, who wants to stop the church's purpose, who wants to stop everything that this church is doing and is about to do. Yes, we come in and we worship Jesus. And yes, we preach Jesus. But this church is such a hub for the community in, in that with dining with dignity in the 4S and the food pantry. There's so much more than just what goes on here on a Sunday. And don't think for a second that the devil wants, doesn't want to stop that as much as he wants to stop this. It's all tied together. And as we get close to our breakthrough, and as you get close to your breakthrough, he puts the pressure against you because he wants you to submit to the pressure. He wants you to submit to the chaos. He wants you to think that it is too great against you that nothing else can be done, that you're just going to be crushed and there's nothing left for you and you should just fall down on your knees and die. But God, but God is there to put his hand inside of you, to put his hand in your life and to push back against the pressure that the devil is putting on the outside so that he can use that pressure to build you up into the vessel that he wants you to be for the purpose that he wants you to live out. I'm just going to pray for us today. If you need prayer, if you, if you do not have Jesus in your life, come find someone at the altar and let's pray for you. I want to do it one-on-one -on -one today. But I just want to pray for us and then we will worship one last time and we will take communion and you guys can go to Burger King. The Heavenly Father, In Jesus' name, I come against every power of darkness that wants to step foot against this building and against this church. And I do not just mean the building, this church. We are the church. So I come against every spirit that is not of heaven that is coming against these people right now in Jesus name and I pray that your angels surround us that they surround them so that whatever is coming against them in their life the pressure that is in them will be greater than the pressure that is against them and if God is for us nothing can be against us so right now in Jesus name I pray pray protection over each and everyone's lives not just in this room but the people that are watching as well because we have real problems but we have a realer God we have someone who is able to do something about it exceedingly and abundantly more than we, we are able to ask think or imagine and I pray right now through the Holy Spirit that any any prayer that needs to get prayed any desire any heartbreak any problem in someone's life that they might not want to utter words to it I just pray that the Holy Spirit says it for them that the Holy Spirit takes it to God and that we will see greater things than we have ever seen and I pray for their purpose, God. I pray for each and every person's purpose in this entire room, for those that are watching online, that they will submit to your process, that they will submit to the pressure that is inside of them, the pull that is inside of them, that is pulling them into their purpose, that is pulling them to a higher level, that is pulling them to a deeper level, that is pulling them from their past, from their pain, from their brokenness, from their bitterness, into their new season, into their blessing, into their life, into their anointing, into to what you have called them to be. I pray that as a church, we no longer 
sit just in here, but we start moving forward and moving out and spreading the gospel like Jesus told us to. Jesus, only you can satisfy. Only you can satisfy. Which means if we are only here on Sunday mornings seeking you, we are unsatisfied for the six other days of the week. And I pray that we all begin to seek you more, that we begin to pray more, that we begin to fast more and submit to the pressure that you are putting in us so that we will see the true power of your glory. Amen. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.